welcome to Global Connections here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and uh, glad to have you joining us today. We have a very special guest who's going to help us unravel a whole host of interesting things, uh, really helping connect Hawaii to the world because he is a local Hawaiian who has uh, recently uh, stepped down from a position with the U.S. Foreign Service, that is, many years as a U.S. diplomat back in Hawaii now, and I'm speaking of none other than Patrick Bronco. I'm joined today by Patrick. Patrick, Thank you for coming and welcome to Global Connections. It's great to see you. It's great to see you too, Dr. Horace. It's been a while. Yes, and listen, I, I'm just, you know, for some of our listeners you, who, who will know you, you've had a storied past, but uh, we have maybe a few who may not know as much, but I want to just uh, give a quick snapshot of some of your background. I know you grew up in Hawaii, a graduate of the Kamehameha Schools, and then uh, your undergraduate studies at Hawaii Pacific University, where I had the privilege of, of getting to know you there long ago. Uh, but from that, you went on to initially do some graduate studies at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C., uh, one of the, really the, the premier, the elite international relations graduate program. Uh, and weaved in there, we'll talk about some of these. You had some important experiences, uh, but more to the point, you would join the U.S. Foreign Service as a young uh, Foreign Service officer, the diplomatic corps of the U.S. government, and a number of duties. Uh, I'll never forget, uh, you know, as a young student, you were studying all about East Asia and Korea and Korean language. You had studied abroad there and, and so on. And where does Uncle Sam send you? He puts you on a plane and sends you to Bogota, Colombia, mm -hmm. uh, which is amazing. And for me, uh, a special, because uh, years ago, I had the opportunity to spend a year living there uh, when I was doing my PhD studies uh, quite some time back. Uh, but I'm delighted because it helped you uh, both gain a quick snapshot understanding of Latin American culture, of the uh, Spanish language. Uh, and so I'd like to take a moment and maybe uh, tell us a little bit about, um, well, a couple of things we're going to cover. We're going to talk about issues of diplomacy on one hand, uh, your own sort of trajectory and how different things you did along the way that helped prepare you for that. And then more importantly, here you are now in your life making a big life change, a switch to come back uh, to help give back to the community uh, and to really see yourself entering the you know the political fray uh, at the moment as a, as a campaign um, uh, for a office in the House, uh, the state uh, legislature. Uh, and beyond that, I think you, you offer us some valuable lessons of you know, what did you learn while you had this experience abroad. So let me stop there. Maybe first ask you, tell us a little bit more about your formation, your background. You know, you're from Hawaii. Uh, and as I already mentioned, why don't you add a little more context to that? Tell us about yourself. Sure. Um, first off, I want to say thank you. It's a real pleasure um, to be on the show, especially with Dr. Horace. Uh, you've been a great mentor to me, and I'm very, very thankful for you. Um, yeah, so local boy, born and raised uh, in Hawaii, uh, fourth generation from Kailua, actually. Um, I had the great pleasure of uh, studying at Kamehameha Schools, and I received a full ride uh, to study at Hawaii Pacific University, where I saw Dr. Horace. And I actually owe Dr. Hor is uh, probably the start to my diplomatic track. When I was at HPU, I was studying Korean language and Dr. Hor sent out an email um, to me encouraging me to apply for the State Department Critical Language um, uh, Scholarship, which is a program that the State Department puts out. Um, no, you don't have to give back anything, but they just want Americans studying critical languages around the world. Yes. Korean, Arabic, um, Farsi, um, languages that are very important um, to us uh, through in foreign relations. And so I was able to get one of these scholarships and I studied uh, in Seoul for one summer. I had already um, studied abroad there, but I got to study in another city, which was interesting. And, yeah. and more intensive I, language training. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it, was, uh, it was basically eight hours a day of wow. Korean language. And so, yeah. and it was also like in Seoul, a lot of people do speak English. So you get by yeah. a little bit. But out in the, the Korean countryside, everyone only speaks uh, Korean. Korean. So it really yeah. forced me. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. It's, it's important. You got to go in a place like that where you are fully immersed. Because as you said, maybe in the capital of Seoul today, it's a global city. You have more of this Korean English. You know, people that are uh, knowing you as, a, as an expat, as a foreigner, they'll speak to you in English to practice theirs. Uh, so from there, this was still your early uh, period right after your uh, undergraduate studies. You made your way over uh, with an additional fellowship this time. Uh, that, that exactly. Took you. To Johns Hopkins, right? Yep. So I graduated 2009 from HPU. And as everyone knows, uh, 2008, the financial crisis, no jobs. But I remember from my orientation that um, there was an opportunity called the Congressman Rangel International Affairs Fellowship. And yeah. so, con yeah, Congressman Rangel was a longtime African-American congressman that um, was in New York. 
Yeah. And he would travel all around the world and they always thought he was the driver. Yeah. And so what he realized was that the face of American diplomacy wasn't truly reflective of the diversity of our country. And it's not just ethnic diversity, but regional diversity, um, gender diversity. State Department traditionally um, is notorious for not being, not being diverse. So he created this program that recruited students across the country, uh, 20 of us in our cohort. Um, they paid for our master's and our internships. So I studied at Johns Hopkins University um, School of Advanced International Studies, and I received my master's in international relations with a focus in economics and Korean studies. And then I went on from there um, to intern on the Hill with Congressman Faleo Mavaenga from American Samoa, as yes. well as uh, do an internship in Embassy Seoul in the Public Affairs um, Division. Mm -hmm. And after I graduated, I entered the Foreign Service uh, at 25, um, the first from Hawaii to receive this honor. Oh, no, fantastic. And of course, I think it's, well, the Johns Hopkins School, of course, the main campus is, uh, we know it's in Baltimore, but this specialized school, the Graduate School in uh, International Studies, is Washington, D.C., where you're really in the hub of everything. It's very well connected to the policy world. Uh, and obviously, as you get plugged into that, through this, uh, through this Wrangell Fellowship, you are in a way on a fast track into the Foreign Service. So you get into the Foreign Service uh, and tell us a little bit about that experience because uh, how many years did you fill that? You did tours in several places. I know in Venezuela as well and then in uh, Pakistan perhaps. Uh, tell us briefly what, what was the, the range of places that you did in your Foreign Service career? So um, normally in, in the Foreign Service, you move posts every two to three years. I was in for seven years and I actually did five posts, which isn't, isn't normal, but uh, um, I like change. I like uh, moving at a fast pace and I like those hard jobs. So I was very fortunate uh, with my Korean language and all of my East Asia studies, the Foreign Service sent me to <laughs> Colombia, Columbia, South, South America. America as my first tour, um, which was an amazing experience for me mm -hmm. because it was right before the, um, the signing of the peace accord. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. When I was there was during... Um, the time of there was still the guerrilla warfare between the Colombian government and the FARC, and and it's still going on with the ELN today. But it was a fascinating time to be there because the U.S. is heavily involved in Colombia. Um, we have a saying that um, Mexico is our most important relationship, but Colombia is our best relationship, and that's why we have a lot of U.S. Uh, personnel, um, U.S. diplomatic service there in Colombia to help uh, this country who was basically on the brink of being a failed drug state to now is one of the fastest growing economies in South America. And it's a strong regional power for us. Absolutely, no, and, and again, Colombia, I had the privilege, I lived there myself in the early 90s and at the time when it was going through some tough times, but you were able to be there witnessing this important uh, you know, political transition, negotiating a long, I mean, literally a 50 year guerrilla war. Uh, and uh, it brought the Nobel Peace Prize to the Colombian president, Juan Manuel Santos, so uh, a lot of attention. And you got to see, again, uh, both internally, the, both the challenges and difficulty, but the excitement, you know, people solving their problems peacefully rather than through violence and war. We need to see more of that in the world, and, 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 and you know, you were able to witness it. Tell us from there, you had from there some other pretty tough duty to it. took you to the Middle Absolutely. East, if I recall. Uh, where else did you go? So after Colombia, I was actually supposed to go to Embassy Seoul, but they asked for volunteers to, um, to go to U.S. Embassy pa uh, to Islamabad, Islamabad in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And so I actually volunteered. Hey. Um, I was like, why not? My, my thought process was uh, I had already lived in Seoul for about two years already. And, you know, I joined the Foreign Service to see the world, not to repeat to countries that I had already lived in. And so I had the opportunity to go to Embassy uh, Islamabad. And within your first two tours in the Foreign Service, you have to do a visa tour. And okay. so I that, that was your visa tour. Yeah. That was my visa tour where I was on the line actually doing um, immigrant visas. Yes. And um, kind of if, if you're familiar with the show 90 Day Fiance, um, mm -hmm. I was the guy mm -hmm. on the other side of the line yeah. that was approving these fiance true, true, visas. True, true. And, exactly. and astonishing. I mean, just the, the literally the seconds that you spend having to very quickly evaluate and use your best judgment to determine is this good or is there a red flag or two that you have to say? No, Absolutely. You're, you're, you've got person's lives right in your hands there. You're determining whether they're going to have a ticket to come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. or not. And absolutely in Pakistan, it's critical as well because, you know, there are terrorist groups in, in Pakistan. So it's very important that we evaluated very to a very strict guideline who actually received U.S. visas to enter the United States. Mm -hmm. And making a bad decision could have dramatic consequences by letting some, you know, 
bad person in, let's say. But exactly. the reality, of course, uh, is all around the world, frankly, including Pakistan, the vast majority of people coming have a very legitimate purpose. Uh, they're contributing, they're doing good, you know, uh, people to people exchange or tourism or investment. Uh, but of course, uh, we live in a world where, yes, uh, there are those uh, bad hombres who, who may be taking advantage of it. But this is, uh, as you said, an important part of any young diplomat. One of the first tours that you do must be the consular services, representing mm -hmm. American interests, deciding the visas and so on. Um, and of course, Pakistan is at, in this time that you went a hardship duty. So you went for less time, right? I think one year only? Uh, one year. Mm -hmm. um, one year. Uh, you basically lived your life. Uh, we lived... Um, how do I say it was, we lived in the, basically we worked in the, in the compound. Yes. In, in, and actually I was there during a time where actually you lived off the compound. Oh, so you had to make the journey every year. Every yeah, day. But oh. always a uh, armored vehicle picked you up every day. Your house was, uh, um, actually the wall was 12 feet tall. Um, it had barbed wire, um, around the top. Uh, I remember one time FaceTiming with my parents and my parents were like, show us the view outside your window. Concrete. And I showed them <laughs> and my parents were like, you sure you're in Pakistan and not in prison? Like, because <laughs> it, it was, it was uh, literally it, a bunker, of course, of yeah, high, high security. And yeah. so, but I had an amazing time there. It was, mm -hmm. um, it helped me grow a lot. It helped me understand, um, you know, being in the foreign service, it does, uh, if you don't have a family, you, you're on your own, right? You're out there and you have to build your own community. And so it did help me grow. And then the, the added pressure of being in, um, I don't want to say it's a conflict zone, but in a zone that's uh, extremely, there's high pressure in Pakistan. Sure, sure. And so it did. Um, and, and the stakes are very high. I mean, the exactly. issues are very important. You can't be fooling around. Uh, you know, the options and choices that a U.S. government policy makes can have consequences. And uh, and it's also, it's a very large country. Population-wise, there's a lot of complexity. Uh, and I know I've encountered through a lot of my own educational exchanges, a lot of Pakistanis, again, who are, uh, you know, brilliant teachers, educators doing important stuff through the Fulbright program, uh, exchanging, you know, scholars. Uh, and it's remarkable. We often have this image from the media that it's all just everything is a war and violence. Everybody's a terrorist. The fact is 99% of the people or more are doing, you know, amazing stuff. And, and, and oh, we, have, uh, we have to appreciate that. And of course, as a foreign service officer, you get to, you have to do that. You have to interact with the, the population, the local host country in every way. Now, Patrick, pretty soon we're going to be coming up on a short break, but what I want to do, um, you know, we'll continue finishing some of your other tours, uh, Venezuela more recently, and then Washington, D.C., where you also had some, some you know, valuable work experience. But what I'd like us to take away, and, and maybe some of our listeners can appreciate, are what are some of the skills and competencies, lessons, the takeaways that are going to help you as you continue in life? And now coming back to Hawaii, you know, what type of things are going to give you, uh, I don't know, you know, the ability to bring uh, even as simple as you know how people do things in different do things in different places often you have a broader view than you might if you only grew up and never left Hawaii mm -hmm. so you bring I think a, a set of insights your own grounding and value as a local boy uh, you know, Hawaiian uh, heritage with you know, your background um, you also have a different way of seeing the world so we're going to take a short break right now Patrick I want us to continue our conversation uh, our viewers come join us back here in just a quick minute after this short break I'm Carlos Juarez, your host here on Global Connections, and we're joined today by Patrick Bronco. Thank you very much, and we'll be right back after this short message. Aloha, I'm Keisha King, host of Crossroads in Learning on ThinkTech Hawaii. On Crossroads in Learning, our guest and I discuss all aspects of education here in Hawaii and throughout the country. You can join us for stimulating conversations to enrich, enliven, and educate. We are streamed live on ThinkTech bi-weekly at 4 p.m. on Mondays. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Welcome back. Uh, we're here on Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and I'm joined today by Patrick Branco. And Patrick is a uh, 
recent uh, foreign service officer with the U.S. Uh, diplomatic service, the diplomatic corps, uh, but a local boy from Hawaii who has now come back and he's uh, taking on some new challenges. Uh, but Patrick, let's finish briefly. We've been, we've been talking a little about your experience uh, as a you know, diplomat uh, in, in various places from Colombia and South America, Pakistan. Uh, and in Pakistan, as I recall, you were working directly with the ambassador or what, what was your role in that, in that place? Uh, you were doing yeah. consular services, but maybe it was after that. T tell us again how it continues. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I was doing consular services during the, the normal work hour and there was an opportunity for young officers. Uh, one of the key parts of, as, as many of people know, it, uh, bureaucracy is understanding where, where the head, where everything comes to the point. Mm -hmm. And that's the ambassador's office in an embassy. And especially in a large embassy like Pakistan, which has thousands of people, um, there was an opportunity for us young um, diplomats to actually work after hours in the ambassador's office. So I would go in after my shift would finish at four on the visa line, and then I would work from five to about nine o'clock actually in the ambassador's office. And there I got to see how all federal agencies, because Embassy Pakistan, Islamabad is so large, there's almost 40 different federal agencies, Amazing, all yeah. submitting information, all submitting memos mm -hmm. up. And it was my job to review, make sure they're appropriate and to do some coordination work mm -hmm, as well mm -hmm, yeah. um, between the various sections to make sure that we have an aligned, consistent American policy when it comes to Pakistan. And so mm -hmm. I did that. And after that, I was able to then parlay that into a position back in Washington mm -hmm. um, in the office of the special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, okay. This office is usually unique because Within State Department, they subdivided into regions. There's mm -hmm. an assistant secretary for Latin America, an assistant secretary for East Asia and Pacific. Uh, Pacific. But because of the unique um, relationship we have with Afghanistan and Pakistan, those two countries were actually taken out and given to a lead special negotiator that was oh, at okay. the assistant secretary level. Oh, and so yeah. I was one of his special assistants. Okay. And because I had lived in Pakistan, I, I understood that nexus of it. But... Mm -hmm. um, as far as understanding bureaucracy in DC, understanding how the building works and develops policy, and then making sure we can implement that abroad in um, Afghanistan and Pakistan was, was unique. So I had the opportunity to join um, the ambassador at the time um, to all of his abroad trips in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and making sure our coalition was strong. That was, excuse me, the work that I was doing to make sure that we had a very consistent, effective policy in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Now, you, you mentioned, of course, in Islamabad, a big, a big embassy, as many other places are. You were in Bogota, maybe not as big, but still a substantial one. Yeah. And frankly, in many of these places, you literally have a, uh, you could say it's an entire country or, or really the all of, entire government. Uh, so many agencies represented, so many issues, agriculture, educational, you know, military, on and on. But more importantly, that the embassy itself really is the entire government in, in one setting, right? It's, it's a little uh, town. It's it, like yeah. a little federal government town. Uh, and, you know, even if you work, let's say, in Washington, D.C., which is the big headquarters, I mean, it's so much larger and diverse. You don't have uh, under one roof, let's say. And so I think you know, your, your insight from uh, working in a place like that, and, and you mentioned coordination. That's, of course, a lot of what's going on, trying to bring together the many, many pieces of this puzzle. Uh, I wonder, Patrick, if, if, you know, from that experience now, as you've come back to reflect on it, what would you say are some of the most important takeaway skill sets that you that you learned? Of course, everything from communication, but you know, cross cultural relations, dealing with Absolutely. different places. Now, as a Hawaii boy, you bring some skill sets to it. That, in fact, uh, the traditional diplomat, you know, from Yale, grew up in Connecticut, doesn't quite have. Uh, and so, maybe talk a little bit about that. What did you bring to the table? But also, what are your takeaways? What are some of the yeah, best absolutely. skills and competencies from your experience? When I talk to students who are interested in becoming diplomats, I actually say, if you're from Hawaii, you were raised to be a diplomat from early on. Here in a multicultural society, we understand. Mm -hmm. uh, we know how to interact with other cultures. We also know how to learn quickly and implement those, those uh, social cultural practices. Um, what got more refined for me in the Foreign Service was the ability to build coalitions, but now building coalitions in a non-English speaking country or building coalitions with those who didn't speak your language. Yeah. So body language, um, the way you acted, the way you showed up, the way you left, um, the way you ate was really important, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, because that yes. could, that's a, you know, how do I say, indirect signals of how you would, how you would um, 
implement policy. So that was very important. Uh, when I showed up in Colombia, I had seven months of Spanish language training, but I still felt like I spoke like a kindergartner. And the interesting thing about uh, language training in the Foreign Service actually is uh, they teach you words like nuclear non-proliferation or uh, um, environmental policy or economic policy. But your ability to maybe tell time or say colors or order food is actually you learn that when you're in the country. Yeah. Um, so those are some life skills that I had to learn, um, mm -hmm. which I think is important, especially for young students, uh, regardless if you want to be a diplomat or not. Mm -hmm. I always encourage students who are in college to study abroad and to study abroad in a country that you do not speak the language or English is not the majority language because you mm -hmm. learn life skills, yeah, yeah. the ability to catch a metro, to send a letter mm -hmm. in a non-English country. It teaches yeah. you life skills where when that's you right. come back home, you can navigate so quickly. Yeah, um, that's right. No, I mean, those are good examples. And, and maybe another aspect in recent years, uh, let's say the last 10 20 years, the U.S. has come under a lot of criticism. Uh, our involvement in Iraq was controversial. Even today, of course, under the Trump administration, a lot of you know tense places. You have to have this ability to both have a level of humility, not be overbearing, the ugly American, uh, but also respectful of the ways and customs in other places, but knowing also that they often have a certain view of the U.S., right? The image of the United States uh, and, for example, Latin America. I always tell my class students that they learn in school, whether it's in Mexico or Colombia or Argentina, the long history of U.S. involvement in the region, you know, many interventions, support for military government. Most Americans, unless you study Latin American history, they never quite know that, that the U.S. has some baggage, maybe it has a you know, context there. Uh, but you know, beyond that, I think you, you, you mentioned a very important thing. The skills that you brought as someone raised in Hawaii, multicultural diversity, uh, those, you know, just the basic survival skills of managing and negotiating that, it teaches you uh, humility and, and appreciation of different cultures, right? Uh, for, uh, coming back now, I wonder, I mean, what, what, are, what would you say are things, now that you see Hawaii from a more mature, more experienced, uh, you know, life, uh, are there things that you appreciate more? Are there things that you maybe get frustrated about? Or are there things that you see as opportunities where Hawaii can, you know, could still keep grounded in its, you know, its, its important cultural base, uh, particularly the indigenous Hawaiian culture? but also be able to embrace or adapt, you know, other things going on in the world. Even as something related to, let's say, the way we handle the pandemic crisis today or other challenges. So what, what can you share about that as, yeah. as some thoughts? Um, being abroad um, and as, you know, as a native Hawaiian, um, it, under, it helped me understand, uh, take a different perspective. Um, for example, in New Zealand, the Maoris are treasured by mm -hmm. those who are non-Maori and actually mm -hmm. they use, they uplift Maoris. They understand the importance that when Maoris benefit, all of New Zealand benefits. And that's something I learned here in Hawaii is I feel for, for my community, sometimes we don't understand the importance of non-Hawaiian allies. And that's mm -hmm. something that I, was, I, I really do believe in. And that's something I do want to work in is because we all have a, an essential place. Like you, Dr. Horace, you, you love Hawaii, right? You understand um, you know, Native Hawaiian rights, Native Hawaiian mm -hmm. culture. And that's something that as we as Native Hawaiians need to embrace more. So being a diplomat helped me understand that, that more. Mm -hmm. Also, um, being abroad was economic perspective. Being in a country like Seoul, for example, who um, after the Korean War was, was poorer than most African countries, who is yeah. like the number 13 economy in the world and has very few natural resources. Amazing, um, yeah. It makes me think about our economy here in Hawaii. And yeah, what we can yeah. do to benefit Hawaii, we have a strategic location, mm -hmm. you know, we are known as the gateway to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to change that. I want to make Hawaii an economic hub, a, a destination for investment, a destination for renewable energy. Um, recently, I told a story um, in 1887, King Kalakaua electrified Iolani Palace with Thomas Edison. It was mm -hmm. a technology that was at the forefront of the world. Yeah. I want Hawaii to be at the forefront of the world in energy production. We're one of the only states that actually can produce all forms of renewable energy. This mm -hmm. is a sector that we need to develop and we can show the rest of the world yeah, how to absolutely. do it in a sustainable way. Yeah. And so if I do get elected to the state legislature, that's something I desperately want to work on. Um, it, additionally, as terms of housing, we have a housing crisis here in Hawaii. We need 65,000 additional units. Um, mm -hmm. How are we going to do that? And I do understand that the rail is controversial here in Hawaii, but it's, a, it's an opportunity. In Singapore, in Tokyo, in Seoul, you can wake up in your apartment and be in the rail station within five to 10 minutes, right? 
And that's something that we need to do. We need to promote more high density um, living all around the, the yeah, transit oriented yeah. development area. I always mm -hmm. stumble on TOD. That's something we need to do. And that's something I saw around the world that we're countries were able to harness yeah. quickly. Absolutely. Um, so and even, you know, the Colombia experience you had, uh, I was there in the early nineties and I saw some early mayors, some municipal leaders who were beginning to strategize and think, well, if you fast forward to the more recent past and you having lived there, they have been very innovative in some of their transportation systems, networks, very flexible. Absolutely. Maybe not so much the hard rail per se, but the these other type of busing. But I think these are the takeaways that, again, someone like you having gone and, and had this experience, not just the mainland, which is typical, maybe more common of, of local Hawaii uh, students who might go study in the mainland, but come back. For you, it was the world. You have seen the world in many parts of it, Middle East, Latin America, Asia. And coming back to Hawaii, you bring that insight. And, and the other, though, you, you spoke about these kind of ideas of how, how what you can harness you know, for economic opportunity. In the end, too, it has to be done in a way well, what I'm getting at here is sustainability and all Absolutely. this sort of green technology. But at the end of the day, Hawaii is a place where the indigenous culture had long thought about these things. It's not new here. It's more, you know, revitalizing what has always been here. The early settlers who came you know, from Polynesia learned how to make the best use of the land and how to manage it more effectively, right? And in the process of development, modernization, we, we sort of lose that. I think mm -hmm. today, uh, as a young leader yourself uh, with ideas, it's also how you combine that local indigenous you know, sort of grounding with modern technology. Uh, and, and, you know, many places have beaches, many places have, you know, wind and energy. Hawaii has this special uniqueness of the culture and the people and the people who make up, you know, beyond the native indigenous Absolutely. Hawaiians uh, who have all come there and adapted and adopted. And, and, and I guess it is something special, as you know, this, the, it's hard to describe for somebody who doesn't go there, but anybody who has experienced Hawaii, either living, and like you mentioned me, I lived 20 years there, at some point, after a few, two, three years, you have to make that decision. You either understand, appreciate, embrace the local culture, or else it's going to come around and punch you very hard. And, uh, you know, as, as someone who did a lot of hiring and decisions to bring people there, uh, it's not easy to find that right fit, right? Um, now, maybe as we finish now in the last um, here you know, a couple of minutes uh, to wind down, um, what other takeaways could you say again as you talk to young leaders, you know, uh, you mentioned Hawaii is already a place, but uh, especially in this world we have now, both globalization is inevitable, it's happening, but it's also being pushed back. There's a lot of criticism, there's a lot of maybe inequality and justice. I mean, just some final thoughts on what do you think are some of the, uh, I don't know, skills and, and, and ways of thinking that we need to have to solve these future problems because this pandemic is also a game changer. We're not going to go back to the old normal. We need to see and envision uh, a better future. And so maybe some final thoughts on your part. About yeah, absolutely. That. Just the world is, uh, is changing around us. Um, Hawaii has always gone through a lot of pivotal changes since, since, uh, since the beginning of its history. Um, for our students here, I always tell them that we have competitive advantages in that. Um, when I was abroad, always people always said how calm we are how willing we are to make coalitions and to found, find solutions, that we have this innate um, hopefulness here. Mm -hmm. And that was something that actually translated extremely well in diplomacy. And I think that could be also translated extremely well um, in our current professional jobs uh, for young students. Mm -hmm. um, we, everyone loves someone from Hawaii. I just mm -hmm. discovered that. And so that's something that we should use um, when we, we do a lot of things in Hawaii well. We are a multicultural society that um, people want to come day in, day out, want to live here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we, we need to use to our advantage. But as, as young students, as young leaders, it's also a great way for us to show the world how Hawaii does it and how Hawaii can achieve something, something great. And we've achieved it here in Hawaii. So um, mm -hmm. I really do uh, tell that to students, you know, play up that you're from Hawaii because it's the best thing. Be proud of who you are. We have a great culture. We have a great history. And that is something that's very important to us as we go into the future. No, well, thank you for sharing that. Again, those are some great uh, closing thoughts. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think it, it, it is important that we have like you, a leader who uh, knows where you're from and, and did you know your, your early life experience in, in the islands. But after having gone abroad, seen the world, worked you know, and carried on your mission uh, with the Foreign Service, now you're back home uh, helping to you know, retool and, and, and 
confront the many challenges we have there, but like a good Hawaiian with optimism and with uh, an ability to reach out because none of us can do anything alone. You've got to build coalitions. And this is what you described. I mean, even as an embassy employee, you're just part of a bigger team and you have to know that mission and share it, but know that you have a larger team helping you the same, now you're back home, you have a big ohana that you've reconnected with. Uh, well, Patrick, let me thank you again for this opportunity to share some thoughts. Uh, I hope we can reconnect and continue our conversation, maybe in some other areas for the next time. Uh, but on that, we're going to close here. Uh, thank you again, Patrick, for joining us here on Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and thank you, audience, for joining us again. And uh, we will pick up next time. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you.